All right, welcome to this uh, very, very uh, great Wednesday afternoon. Um, yes, so I am, I am Nick, as you can see, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, psychology and UX design. Um, and it's, uh, it's a really interesting topic because um, as, as humans, we have a lot of um, ways of processing information that aren't necessarily ready, uh, are readily available or observable from, um, from your point of view. So um, yeah, let's get started. So uh, yes, as mentioned, I work for Canva. Um, Canva is a online graphics platform. So we have a web app, an iPad app, and an iPhone app. Um, uh, all of the, the Canva engineering team is, uh, is here at DevWorld. So also all the iOS engineering team is here at DevWorld. So go and say hello in the uh, small time you have left. Um, and uh, yes, if you want more Canva credits, I can definitely hook you up with more Canva credits. Who wants more Canva credits? Yeah! yeah! That's all right, yes, I'll get to all those people that said yes later. All right, so when I came to, um, to looking at a talk, I thought, well, I need to do a psychology talk. Let's see what I can do in 30 minutes. So I went to uh, thingsyoucandoin30minutes.com, and I had a bit of a look at, uh, at the list. So number four on the list was I can tap into my purpose. Um, so if I, uh, I might try and tap into my purpose on the stage. I can also engage, engage in something. I have no idea what. I can make a smoothie. So that's something you can do in 30 minutes. I can have a dance party, or I also floss. All of those things you can do in 30 minutes. And there was nowhere on that which said, give a presentation about psychology. So I was a little bit screwed. So I had to come up with something myself. Um, now, as you're, as you're looking at well-designed apps, um, you often have a feeling of being able to tell when something is a good experience or a bad experience. But you can't always put your finger on it. Now, as, um, as uh, you, you use these apps, um, you, can, you can kind of tell that you like the animations or that you like the flow, but it's not always the case that, um, that you can actually understand why, why your brain um, thinks this is a really good time. Um, and to help explain this, I have to go a little bit further back. Now, um, explaining science is obviously a little bit redundant, but science is our way of making sense of the world. This will make sense a little bit later. So we perform control, controlled experiments um, to, uh, on the world around us to try and um, explain phenomena that exist. And we call these explanations theories. So theories, in order for a theory to be scientific, um, it needs a few qualities. It needs to be based on observable fact, and it needs to be testable. Um, and, and usually they're tested with experiments. So this is validated by, um, by other experts in the field, and, um, and the finding, so, so that the findings are actually as correct as they can be. Now, when something no longer, non, sorry, when something no longer makes sense, um, we revise the theory. Um, because of external data or new information or new technology, which allows us to collect those two things, um, we, we revise theories all the time. And usually we actually aren't that wrong, we're just a little bit off. And the reason why all of this is important is because psychology is a science. So just like we collect information on the world around us, we collect information that makes sense of humans. Now these, um, these theories um, that we collect help to, to make sense of the patterns that humans um, elicit as they're both interpreting information and, um, and doing different things. But it turns out it's actually very hard to test these theories in isolation, which doesn't make it very scientific. For something to be scientific, you have to um, kind of not necessarily prove, but um, you have to be able to say that a certain condition is met um, and that that condition nearly always holds true, or always holds true. And with humans, that's very hard because you can't necessarily peer into someone's head and isolate a certain thought. Everything is kind of connected. And even, even if you ask them, so if you, said, if you said something to someone and you asked them what they thought about it, um, and even if they were being honest, there's no guarantee that the thing that they said back is going to be um, any reflection of how their actual thought process um, came about. And for that reason, psychology is still very young as a discipline. We still don't know a lot about how people interact, uh, how people process information. We have kind of a set of theories, but those are constantly evolving. Um, and uh, um, over the last sort of 100 years, um, 
also at the start of psychology, it evolved quite quickly. We found that we can find out more and more information, but then we, got to, we kind of got to a point where we figured it was unethical to keep people in cages and, and probe them. So we had to kind of pull that back a bit, and now we're waiting for technology to catch up so that we can better understand how to, uh, how to test um, in a non-invasive and non-damaging um, way. And from that, it turns out that uh, human brains are actually pretty weird. And they process information in a way that doesn't actually always make sense. So it doesn't make logical sense, but um, um, so, some of these processes are learned. So you learn them from your parents, you learn them from the culture that you're brought up in, and some of them are just hardwired into your brain. And so in that sense, you really, you really actually have no idea what you're doing most of the time. Um, when you're presented with certain stimuli, um, your, your brain will process them in a way um, that, I mean, there's, there's lots and lots of different theories um, about lots and lots of different information processing, but your brain will often process it in a way that is beneficial to you or that, that helps you understand the thing better. Um, but a lot of languages, other than English, actually have a term for um, reality as it exists and reality as it's perceived. Now, English only really has reality, um, but that distinction is actually quite important because um, the, the perceived reality um, is the one that we actually experience every day. So, with that in mind, let's have a bit of a talk about, about biases. So, um, who here thinks that the iPhone UI is better than the Android UI? Put your hands up. All right, good. That's, that's most of you. So who here thinks that the Android UI is better? So one guy over there. So what if I told you that you're all pretty biased? Except for maybe, oh, no, even those three guys. They're still biased. So in reality, the, um, the I mean, coming to, a, to an iOS or a Mac conference, um, you can pretty much expect that the people there that work with Apple technology every day um, are going to look favorably um, like the vast majority of you are going to look favorably on, on these kind of technologies. Um, and, and those kind of things are what we call, um, like if, if you have to make a decision between those two things somewhere down the road, most of the people that, um, that enjoy Apple technology and use it every day are going to pick the Apple option over, um, for, for various reasons, um, and those kind of things are, are represented as a bias. So biases are just part of all, all parts of human interaction. Um, they're often uh, observed as, as like strong preferences or preferences towards certain things, and it's stuff that people will consistently um, elicit as, uh, as they make certain choices. Now, a cognitive bias is something that's a little bit lower level. So a regular bias is something that, um, that can easily be observed, and you can just kind of tell when 80% or 90% of the room puts their hand up that people here are a little bit biased towards um, iPhone software. Um, but a cognitive bias is much, much harder to measure because they're usually pretty subconscious. And they happen because you observe or um, interpret information in a certain way. And, uh, and these, these biases influence the way that you think and process everyday information. Um, but it turns out that these kind of cognitive, cognitive biases aren't totally unique. And they're often a result of a flaw of the way that you process information or something that's learned, as I mentioned. So one that's really interesting is um, one called the self-serving bias. And, um, and this is all about attribution of responsibility. So for the self-serving bias, you have an event um, and you have an outcome. And um, in the outcome of a negative event, people are more likely to attribute that outcome to extrinsic sources. Um, and this is what this, this bias says. And um, that means if you, say, have, um, have a, a university exam, and you take that exam, you don't do very well, people are on the whole more likely to attribute the result of that exam to the exam being too hard, or, some, or that you were too tired, or that um, any kind of external source was the cause of you failing. Um, but on the, on the opposite side, positive events are often attributed to intrinsic sources. So if you did really well on the exam, you may attribute that to, um, to you studying really hard and getting the result that you deserve. Um, so how does this relate to, to computers? Well, 
Um, a, a study from Moon and Nass looked at um, the, result, the interaction between this, this bias and um, computers. And they found that, um, that with people with familiar, so people with positive outcomes um, and familiar computers, they would credit the computer for the action. And uh, with positive outcomes and unfamiliar computers, they would um, internalize that credit. So um, if you did something really well and you had no idea what the computer was, then you will, you will credit yourself for being really good at computers or, or something like that. But in a negative outcome, um, people will actually, and, and using, using a, commuter, sorry, a computer that you're quite familiar with, um, people will actually internalize that blame and they'll blame themselves. And that you know, kind of makes sense, but it's, um, it's interesting to see that it's actually documented. Um, now, just looking at the, the um, we don't really care too much about the positive outcomes. If someone, um, if someone has a positive outcome with your application, then um, we don't really care whether the credit is, is attributed to them or the computer. It's mostly fine. But the negative one is the one we have to pay attention to. So um, if they're using a familiar computer and, uh, and they have, encounter a problem or a negative outcome, they're more likely to blame themselves than they are to blame the, the computer. And the, the computer that people are most familiar with are the ones that they carry around in their pockets. And those, um, that's actually quite, quite interesting. So um, if you have an application um, that looks like it should work and the person um, is familiar with how applications work and it doesn't work, they blame themselves. And in reality, um, it's probably not their fault. It's probably not their fault that the software is bad or that it doesn't work. It's probably that, that you could have accounted for certain things that, um, that you didn't. Um, so what do we do about that? So if you're trying to make a user feel better after they blame themselves, it's already too late. And so unfortunately, the answer to this question is that it depends. So what can you actually do about um, a, that misattributed internal blame? Um, so being aware of it is, is half the battle. Being aware that um, users are more likely to um, to blame themselves and thus, um, yeah, the more likely to blame themselves um, when, when things go wrong can help you to um, create UI that, um, that avoids those situations or that, um, that helps to shift the blame somewhere else. Um, prototyping early and often can help to, um, to test those, uh, those theories with people around you and try and figure out, um, to, to actually try and stop this from happening in the first place. Um, and educating and empathizing with your users is one that um, helps to better understand how, how users feel as they're using your app. Um, one, of, one of the biggest tips that I can give, and I'm, I'm very um, guilty of this, is that I get very emotionally attached to the UI that I create because I spend a lot of time making sure that everything looks really good. And so when someone tells me they don't get it um, or that they, they did something wrong, um, it's very easy for me, and they're like, oh, I just couldn't figure it out. It's like, all right. Well, I, it's very easy for me to go, well, that's, that's your problem. That, like, you should have been able to figure that out. I can figure that thing out. Um, but being emotionally attached to UI means that you're less likely to, to want to change something or iterate on that. Um, and so being conscious of that helps to, to help iterate faster and move through problems. Also, um, when testing your, your UX, don't rely on feedback that you can't observe yourself. Um, Self-reporting is really super biased. Um, if you give the app to your family, you give the app to your friends, um, and they say, oh yeah, no, I had a really great time, everything went well, um, and, uh, and they don't actually give you much more information or they, uh, they don't really detail exactly what they do, um, it's pretty likely that, um, that they, they may have encountered certain things or encountered certain problems, they don't want to, to hurt your feelings or do something like that. But um, the other problem is that um, if you give it to fellow engineers, engineers are very, very good at solving problems. So good, in fact, that they solve problems without even thinking about it. They come across some kind of thing, they develop a workaround by, by just doing something different, and then they think that's no longer a problem. And that's, I mean, that in itself is a very large problem. So, um, so make sure that you get to watch all of your user testing as it's happening, um, as, as that's one of the really big, uh, big indicators of trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and yeah, basically don't let users get into a state where they blame themselves. All right, so um, I have to go a little bit quicker, even though I'm going very quick. One minute. 
Um, yes, so user behavior is another thing that you want to help modify in your app. And often in your app, you want to encourage specific types of behavior. And for that, we have um, one particular model of behavior is the, the fog behavior model. Um, and that says that there are three things required to elicit a certain behavior. That you need motivation, ability, and a trigger. Um, motivation is um, something that um, Zach talked about quite a bit in his talk yesterday. So I definitely recommend catching that if you haven't seen it already. Um, but, um, but those three things are, are really important. Motivation being the, uh, the, the motivation to actually go and do something, the ability being the ability to actually do it, and the trigger um, being the trigger. So um, that was a terrible explanation. I wouldn't recommend doing that again. Um, so motivation, um, that's what happens when you start talking before you realize what you want to say. So motivation is, uh, can be split down into two different types. Um, one being intrinsic and the other being extrinsic. Intrinsic motivation comes from within. So an example of that would be um, you want to do really well on, um, on like your test or something um, just because you want to be the smartest person and know all of that knowledge versus extrinsic motivation, which is the, uh, the more carrot on a stick approach. So applying a reward for doing something or, um, or punishing someone for, for not doing something. Um, so what we do at, um, so I'll, I'll give you a real world example of, uh, of this model that, um, that we uh, applied. So we have this real problem with app reviews. We released our iPhone app um, uh, about a month or so ago. And for the first couple of weeks, we were getting, um, we got maybe 200 reviews. And they were, they were okay, like the majority of them were five stars. Um, but it ended up being that the overall rating was about three and a half to four stars. And we're like, what's, what's going on? Um, and it turns out that app reviews are actually um, like fall into this model exactly. Um, and for a bad app review, the motivation to leave that, ba uh, that, that bad review is that the, um, the user is, is angry that something has gone wrong. Or well, they're not satisfied with, with either paying their money or in this case, that they weren't getting their, their value out of their time. Um, the, the ability um, is, is granted by Apple. So they have the ability to leave this review um, pretty much guaranteed. And, uh, and the trigger ends up being, for a bad review, ends up being that um, there, there's some kind of crash in your app or that the frustration gets to a point where it gets to, uh, where it boils over and they go to the store in a fit of rage and leave their review. Um, but having a look at, um, at positive reviews, all of those things aren't necessarily there. So we have, um, we have motivation for positive reviews. Um, which is that intrinsic motivation. So they get value out of the app. They enjoy using your app, um, but uh, and it's, so that's their, their motivation to leave a good review. They have the ability, um, which is again, Apple's provided ability to leave reviews, but they actually don't have any trigger. And that's really interesting because you never really think about, um, it, I mean, you don't often think about it, but, but people who leave good reviews don't often have any, motive, like any, any real um, impetus to go and, go and give you that good review. So we implemented the same thing that everyone does, um, and that is to, um, to give them an opportunity to review your app. And we put it at a time when, um, when they were basically doing nothing. So after they'd shared their design and they get uh, taken back to a neutral state, um, we prompted them to review um, the app. And I mean, I was quite surprised at the actual effect that it had. So that was the first two weeks, and on the, on the right was the second two weeks, and that's actually four times the amount of five-star reviews, which is huge. And, uh, and so now we have a, a pretty solid five-star rating in the store. Um, and I mean, it, it's, it's counterintuitive because you don't want to annoy your users too much, but without that trigger, um, the people just aren't going to do it. Um, yeah, so another thing I wanted to talk about um, is uh, interface design. Now, um, people find it really, really hard to use things in unfamiliar ways. And that's, you know, that's pretty obvious because, um, because you, can't, you can't do what you don't know. Um, and <clears throat> this, this is rooted in a, um, a theory called functional fixedness, where people actually have a tendency to wholly judge, whoop, 
people have a, whole, uh, a tendency to wholly judge an object by its look. Uh, just like the, uh, the old saying, don't judge a book by its cover, that um, people actually pretty much look at something and go like, this is a drink bottle, all it can ever do is hold, hold liquid, and that's, that's all it does. So, um, so that's, I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? Like you, you look at something, you go, I know what that does, that thing does, um, does X, um, but it actually goes a little bit deeper than that because functional fixedness affects your ability to, to even come up with novel ways of using those, um, of using those, uh, those objects. So people find it hard to move past their mental model of an object. Um, and and uh, a, a classic example of this is uh, Dunk, oh yeah, I can't say his name, Dunkner's candle problem. And in this problem, you're given these three objects. So, can, uh, and, and told that uh, you need to uh, attach the candle to the wall. So can anyone tell me, using those three objects, how you would attach the candle to the wall? Someone has to speak louder or put their hand up. Someone has already read, oh sorry, sorry the, um, what was it? So how would you get the wax to stick on the wall in time? You'd use the box. So the, the interesting thing is that most people, um, I mean, it's, it's obviously a bit, like if you can practically do it, you can see how certain ways don't work. I think the, the wax thing, um, if you try and affix the wax to the wall, it dries before you can get the candle on it or something like that. But um, so what actually happens is that they're given those three objects and, um, and told to do it. And most people will try and use the tax to fix, uh, to fix the candle to the wall. Um, and, uh, and what the actual intended solution is that you, you melt the wax onto the box, you put the candle in the box, and you use the tax on the box to stick it to the wall. Um, and they found that, um, that most people tried to, to use the thing that was supposed to be affixing stuff to the wall to, to directly try and attach the candle without trying to use the other objects. Um, and they also found that, uh, um, that if they handed all of the objects separately, so they put the matches and the tacks and the box and the candle, and they handed all of them separately to the, to the person doing the experiment, they were much, much, much more likely to use the box in, in the experiment, and use it to use it to try and attach it to the wall. And this is a pretty, pretty good example of functional fixedness because you see that the tacks come in the box, but you don't necessarily assume that you can use the box. Um, and the reason why this doesn't quite work in a crowd like this is because engineers and designers solve novel problems every day. And it's our job to think outside of the box. We think, um, we think in ways to, to create new stuff out of nothing. Um, and, and in that respect, the norm is not actually always what you feel is the most obvious way of doing something. If you create a UI that has, um, that has a, a particular use or a particular um, series of events that need to happen, um, that's not always the most obvious way to everyday people. Um, and that's because they, it, a lot of people find it very hard to move past um, the, the functional aspect of the thing that they know. So if you're going to deviate from the norm, um, make sure that you're willing to, to educate or, or guide people on that path. Um, yeah, so one example of that in Canva was that we, uh, we have this, this editor and uh, we have all of the objects you can touch. Um, so with a single tap, you can select the image, you can select the text, you can select the, the colors. Um, at one point, we changed the, um, the text. So you used to be able to tap the text again and, uh, and edit it straight there. Um, so everything had a, like a one-tap thing. Um, but we found that was actually quite, uh, it was quite mixed and people were, were getting things wrong all the time. And we had to change one of the, uh, one of the boxes to be a double tap. And it was actually a really overwhelming response. I think about 60% of people no longer understood how to edit text. And I mean, you give it to engineers and they have no problem. Like they're, they're willing to explore, they're willing to do lots of things. But um, everyday user testers just couldn't figure out where to go from there. They're like, oh, the text must, must just be static. You can't change it anymore. And so we had to give them a little bit of prompting. Um, and it's, 
uh, it's actually progressive as well. So unless you go to, uh, to actually edit the text, the, um, the dialogue doesn't come up. And, uh, and yeah, so it's a, it's a mix between um, kind of like an onboarding or a, uh, or a guiding experience and, um, and solving this problem where uh, things don't operate as expected. So I think the last thing that I want to talk about, and this is probably um, the, the most important one, sorry, from my point of view, is uh, the one that's, I guess, one that's most overlooked is user confidence. Um, and that's, yeah, and that's one that's, that's most overlooked um, when you're designing an experience. You never really think about how, um, how confident someone is in achieving their task. You just want to um, see, them get to, see them get to the end. Um, but confidence in general is our ability to trust in something. And uh, if you are at one of those uh, kind of work retreats and you do that um, stupid falling thing where everyone has to try and catch you, um, giving your trust to someone else is, is showing your confidence that they're going, to, they're going to catch you and not just drop you on the ground. Um, and if, if you're me, I have, I have very little confidence that uh, my workmates would be able to catch me, not, not, because, not because I don't trust them to do it, but just because I think I would continue falling onto the ground with them holding me. <laughs> um, so when a user doesn't trust your UI to achieve the task, it's really frustrating. Um, when they don't have confidence that, that you're guiding them down some path that will eventually lead to them doing what they want, um, they're less likely to, to, to trust you. Um, and what you really want is, um, is for them to you know, walk around and feel like they, they know exactly what they're doing all of the time. So um, here's a few tips on how to, how to deal with um, problems with user confidence. And one of those is to hint your software towards the intended action and uh, make it hard to make mistakes. So um, one thing that we, we do a lot at Canva is we, we cater for the 95%. So if we can come up with a case where, where at least 95% of people are going to be doing a certain action, we make sure that the software kind of hints, um, hints the answer in that direction. So um, one example of this is uh, sliders in our, um, in our filtering views. So it takes note of what all the sliders are set to when you open the view. And um, if, you, if you change one of the sliders and then decide you don't actually like it and go to change it back, um, as you approach the value that it was originally set to, it actually snaps a little bit and makes it very easy to, to end up exactly where you were. Um, and that's just one example of, of hinting. Um, another thing is to, uh, to achieve like, the least amount of steps towards victory for your users. Um, always strive to, to, to make the smallest amount of... Um, smallest amount of uh, roadblocks to get to, to where they want to go. Um, this, is, this is very evident if you've ever used any um, online shopping um, carts. You find if you have to add six different types of information over six different panels, it becomes a very long and arduous thing. And I've actually stopped buying things because I don't like the way that I have to keep, like, it is, it is a new panel every time. If they just um, consolidated some of that stuff down and made, made it very easy to, to check out, like what Amazon does, um, it's, it's very, very easy, and I bought a lot of stuff off Amazon, even by accident. <laughs> um, and another one is to give people a visible path to solve their problems. Now, we had a real problem when we launched the iPhone app. We um, accidentally introduced a bug into our login, which um, caused the, the errors to fall back to a really generic error. And that meant that if people were trying to log in and they already had an account, or they were trying to log in with Facebook and they already had a registered email account, we could no longer tell them exactly how to solve their problem. And it just said, um, your username and password is incorrect. And while that seems pretty obvious, it made a really big difference to the amount of people that, um, that could actually use your app. Um, and, and we had quite a few reviews of people going, you know, I can't even log in. Why would I bother using your app? Um, and it's because we gave them no visible path on how to, on how to solve their thing. So we spent um, you know, half a week looking at all these messages. We fixed the original bug, but we made it much, much better than we had originally intended um, just because we found this problem. And in that respect, messaging is super important. So if you think that um, it's, it's unlikely that someone is going to, to come to the conclusion themselves, then being able to give them some kind of messaging or hinting them in the right direction will solve um, some of those problems. And the last thing of confidence is, is optimizing um, both for the first time and for, for when your users return. 
So um, it's, really, it's really nice to give a nice kind of specky, interesting experience when everyone uses React for the first time. You like to show them grand animations and, uh, and lots of sparks flying out and egg timers that turn upside down. But, um, but that quickly becomes very, um, very tedious if people are going to repeatedly use your app. So optimizing for the first time where they get to see all of that, but then maybe um, reducing the amount of animation time or um, uh, making shortcuts available inside your app can help to give users a, a feeling of mastery and a, an extra confidence in, uh, in doing what they're doing. All right, so a really quick summary. Um, things I want you to take away from this talk. One is uh, never think the way you think is the only way that people think um, because it's just, it's just not true. Like pretty much uh, there are so many, like humans are so unique and so different that it becomes very, very hard to, um, to properly account for the way they do everything. Um, and if you assume that everyone knows exactly what you know or that everyone thinks um, about problems the same way you do, um, there's invariably gonna be issues when people try to figure stuff out. Um, the second thing is functional fixedness is working against designs that do novel things. So that doesn't mean don't do novel things, it just means if you're gonna use something that, has, that already has a really obvious purpose to do something different, make sure that you consider that and uh, educate your users to, to help, um, help get them achieve their tasks. And the last thing is that giving a user confidence empowers them and makes them feel good. So um, if you can give a user confidence by, by hinting your software in certain directions or by making sure they have a visible path to solving their problems at all times, then, um, then making them feel good and giving them um, that, that kind of good experience is, uh, is uh, sorry, giving them that confidence is a good way to get good experiences. All right, um, that, is, that is the end. If you have um, uh, any questions or, or uh, other things, you can send me an email or on Twitter. Um, if you uh, want to learn more about Canva or you want more Canva credits, come and see me. I've got lots of those. Um, and of course, we are, we are a startup in Sydney. So if you want to move to Sydney and you're, a, um, and you're an iOS developer, a designer, a web developer, anything, come and have a chat to me. We're hiring the best engineers in the world and it's a really great team. So uh, thank you very much. All right, do we have any questions? Just do a bit of a dance. Yeah, well. Yeah, well. What's your question? If you ask a question, you get some camera credits. Yes, that is true. Do you want some camera credits? You get camera credits for that. Would anyone else like some camera credits? I'll hand them out. Go yeah. for it. Yes, Louis. So yeah, your table of uh, I'm good at a computer, not good at a computer. Mm -hmm. uh, blame myself, blame others. Um, so what, the, the square top left, which was I'm familiar with my device, but it doesn't it was a negative, work. a negative outcome. Yep. So that would be that I blame myself. Mm -hmm. But I feel like I'm pretty good on a Mac. And if something doesn't work on a Mac, I blame the Mac because I know what's going on there. So is, mm -hmm. it, that, is it that most people actually do, they, they blame themselves if they are familiar with the computer? Yeah, so, uh, so the question was, um, was that if you're familiar with the computer and, um, and you have a negative outcome, that, uh, that the expected thing is that you blame the machine. But Louis says that he doesn't blame his machine and that... Oh, you do, so you do blame your machine and, not, and don't blame yourself. Sorry, the other way around. Um, I guess the answer to that is that um, every, everyone is very different. And uh, you as an engineer know exactly what's going on in the computer. Um, and you know that you should be able to complete that task um, and that you have the ability to do that. Um, and the computer is the thing that's stopping you. But a lot of people don't necessarily know all the things that computers can do or know how to use the computer um, that well. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to blame Louis, go for it. Oh, man. Great. All right. Thank you very much.